I'm Jim Ferris, and I direct the Center on Philanthropy and Public Policy at USC, as well as a member of the faculty of the Saul Price School of Public Policy. You name for us. Um, on behalf of the Center's Board of Advisors, I'm glad that you're able to join us today for this conversation on philanthropy and the arts. Um, I'm delighted that Dana and Stephen have agreed to um, help us have this conversation. Um, we're really delighted that y'all are here and are gonna share your thoughts. Um, but before we get started, I wanna acknowledge a few people who made tonight possible. Um, the host committee for tonight's event, Louise Bryson, why don't you just raise your hand. Uh, Janice Tober, Norma Sebastian, and two of our board members, Trent Stamp and Nestor Wachtel. And we also have one of our other board members here this evening, Jeff Hoffman. Jeff? As some of you may know, the center's mission is to provide research and analysis that helps philanthropists and foundations solve public problems. And in doing this, we want to make sure that we have research that is useful and usable. And we want to, to do this, we try to be engaged with the field. <laughs> and what happens in the last few years, we've discovered and observed, that philanthropy was quite fragmented. Um, as Brad Smith at the Foundation Center refers to it, it's really like an archipelago. Every, there are different segments of philanthropy that talk to themselves, but not across the segments. And so this series was designed to try and sort of bridge across those islands in philanthropy so that it could have a greater impact. So we'd be very delighted um, if you tell us, give us feedback as we sort of continue with this conversation um, on philanthropy series. Um, that doesn't mean we're not going to continue to do our Distinguished Speaker Series. Um, our next one is on March 20th here in Beverly Hills with um, Peter and Jennifer Buffett of the Novo Foundation. Um, but we think that this kind of format might be very interesting to have a conversation. And so we're really not going to have speeches tonight. We're going to have conversation. And so as Stephen and Dana sort of start kick kickstart the conversation, I'm hoping you're thinking of your questions for them as we get started. Um, let me just briefly introduce um, Dana and Stephen more formally. I assume most of you know who they are, but Dana Joya is now the judge, USC Judge Whitney Professor of Poetry and Pu Public Culture as of this fall, this past fall. Um, previously, he served as chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. He's an internationally acclaimed and award-winning poet, a native Californian um, with a bachelor's degree and an MBA from Stanford and an MA in comparative literature from Harvard. Um, Stephen Levine is the president of the California Institute of the Arts, a position he has held since 1988. And in addition to being a consultant or an advisor to arts and education groups, he's on many boards, such as the Idlewall Arts Foundation, Endowment Inc., KCRW, um, National Public Radio, and so forth. Um, so tonight, I can't think of two other, two luminaries in the field of arts, people that think about it, that do it. Um, than um, Steve and, and Dana. So we're delighted that y'all are here today. Um, and the way we're gonna do this, we're trying experimenting with our formats. I'm gonna just pose sort of one big question and they're gonna run with it for a while and then at some point I will interrupt them and we'll transition to the audience. Um, but you know, um, one of the things the center has done in the past is actually work with journalists and editors to talk about philanthropy. And I remember um, we took them to Disney Hall and we got into this big debate about, well, really should philanthropy be building concert halls when there's so many other problems in society? 
And so I think one of the issues for the arts is how do you make the case for the arts in an era where there are so many other public problems like poverty, healthcare access, or how do you make the case for arts in the schools? Both, you know, should you put public dollars into it or philanthropic dollars? What is the best case for the arts? And um, to what extent do these efforts that talk about um, the role of arts in economic development or arts in the civic engagement create a case for the arts? And so with that, I think you have a lot to work with, so we'll let you run it. Damon, you wanna? Yeah, I'd be happy to, to go first. And, you know, I, 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 Jim, I'm, Steve and I are really uh, happy to initiate your undistinguished speaker series. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, it's always good to be called at your own worth. Uh, it's an issue, you know, really of two things, I think, which is, you know, first of all, what is your vision of the society you're trying to create? I mean, because if you're involved in education, in philanthropy, in, in the arts, to a certain degree, you, you have a sense of a vision. You know, we all want to help create the society in which we want to live. And if you look at that, are you going to get it entirely by remedial efforts to correct problems? Or must some of the effort go into creating individuals uh, who, in a sense, have the ability you know, to sort of lead their lives uh, more productively, to create communities more, uh, more productively? We all essentially believe in that theory a little bit, or we wouldn't make public education mandatory. But if you, if you look at this, we have a, a really significant problem in the United States. I don't, even though I come from Hawthorne, from an immigrant family, I'm the first person in my family ever to go to, to college. I have first cousins who are in, serving hard time in jail. Uh, so I, you know, I am from, in a sense, uh, somewhere where I should understand this experientially. I didn't fully understand it intellectually till I chaired the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, and we began, almost by accident to be doing research for things like reading, literary reading, high school attendance, uh, high school arts programs. But I'll simply start with a very simple statistic. One out of every three American teenagers fails to finish high school. Our public officials do an extremely assiduous job of disguising this criteria. In LA, they'll claim that we have a 96% graduation rate because 96% of the kids in LA who enter their second semester of their senior year graduate. Uh, but, but the fact is that one out of every three. Now, what happens to those kids is that they don't do, obviously, as well in education. They don't do as well in the job market. They don't do it as well by any socioeconomic measure that they have. They have significantly less civic involvement. They vote less. They tend to be incarcerated at overwhelming levels. But I'll simply give you one simple statistic. They will live seven years less than the kids who finish high school. And we know all the reasons. We don't have to elaborate that. So th now, is it because they're not being fed? Uh, is it because they don't have adequate medical care? Or is it perhaps? Uh, even if those things exist, there's something about the society they live in and the schools they attend to which does not speak to their spirits, does not speak to their imagination, does not give them, feed their imagination with a vision of their own life which is compelling enough for them to stay. Now, we, you know, we also know that it's overwhelmingly tied to their reading level, to their ability to read. We also know that kids who read uh, tend, in a sense, to have a different narrative of their life than kids who don't read. They tend to develop greater empathy. They tend to develop a, a greater sense of their own personal destiny. So uh, I don't believe we need to, to justify the arts for anything other than celebrating the glory of what it is to be human. But saying that, it is very clear that arts, arts participation, has extraordinary uh, social personal, psychological impact on people that participate, which is in some ways measurable. If we try to uh, make the society in which we want to live, the just society, merely 
through material uh, interventions, I think we will inevitably fail because we, will, uh, we live in a society in which we are not spiritually, imaginatively engaging uh, our citizens and especially our young. We're losing one third of, our, of the generation. Uh, if I go back, and uh, cut me off, of, uh, let me say just one more minute. If I go back to my own childhood, being raised by people who were not native speakers of English, what made me get to Stanford, get to Harvard, eventually get to Washington, and even ultimately USC, was the fact that I be, I, there were a few books in the house. My mother, who was a Mexican woman of no great education, knew poems by heart from school which she recited. I had a, a, a nun at St. Joseph's in Hawthorne who gave me piano lessons and theory lessons for $6 a month, a weekly one-hour lesson and a weekly one-hour group theory lesson. Had me playing Bartok and then Beethoven and Chopin and Bach. Uh, and these things opened up possibilities that I didn't quite understand that were not available among the people that I, that I lived with. You know, there was not a high school in LA so poor when I was a kid, when the budgets was much smaller, the GDP was much smaller, that didn't have a music program, a theater program, some kind of studio arts program, and even basic dance instruction. A, a far richer society with far more material intervention has cut that away. And all of the uh, essentially success uh, measurements that we have of, of younger people has gone down and down and down. It's not because we're stupid immigrants. Uh, you know, I'm from an immigrant family. It's because I think what we've done is we've narrowed you know, this thing down uh, to a thing where we'll, you know, we'll feed you, we'll keep moving your body forward, but we don't really talk to you in the fullness of your humanity. We don't recognize you as creatures of imagination, dreams, and ambition. We're, we're essentially in agreement. Uh, I'd come at it from a slightly different angle, but end up the same place. Um, the easiest argument to make, and we were failing at making it, uh, the superintendent announced that the 350 new arts teachers in LAUSD, that it took a decade. Uh, Harold Williams and I led the commission that led to the decision to hire him, and they'll be gone by the end of this year. Um, decades of work just sort of thrown out. Um, our current approach to school reform is if a kid is failing at reading, you give them a second reading course. If they really hate what they're doing, you give them more of it. Uh, and if you give them enough of what bores them, uh, you'll be successful at the end of the day. Um, the, the argument I would make for the arts in the schools, and that's a little different than the argument yeah. for the, in the broader society, is that in fact it's the cheap cure for a lot of our problems in the schools. Um, we all know in our own lives uh, that um, learning to trust your own worth is the core of achieving at anything. Um, the arts, in, an, in a very easy way, you can do this through any discipline, but the trouble is to do it in science, you gotta know some science first. Uh, because the arts as they're taught, or can be taught, say, you're gonna make this out of yourself. You're immediately granting value to the student's own experience. And you're saying what you have to contribute is, is important. So simply as a, as, a, as a just baseline issue of students discovering their own uh, possible efficacy and value in the world, uh, it should be a slam dunk. Uh, but it's not, obviously. All over the country, oh, well, in fact, it's, it's very interesting. Every private school adds more and more arts. They know it's how you be successful. If Paul Cummins is, do, is building a school, it's everywhere. We all know it ourselves, but somehow we think that kids who don't have much should have less. Uh, and we've, we've created a school system that grants them that. Um, I'll just tell you one little side story. With the, with the help of many people who are here, uh, we for 20 years, 23 years, have been sending 300, this is, sounds like a plug for us. It is a plug for us. Uh, <laughs> But there's, a, but there's a story worth telling in it, which is uh, 
uh, we, we taught a program in a school which was uh, for unwed mothers. It had daycare so they could come. Uh, the message these mothers receive is that they've screwed up and whatever happens to them next they deserve uh, because they were stupid. We did a program in which they simply made documentary films about one another's life. And of course, what they discovered was they're going to school. They, were, they didn't accept that this was the end uh, because they've gotten themselves into a more complicated. Well, you get, you get the message. It's, it's everywhere. Every teacher knows it at some level. Uh, because we, we pride ourselves in America at a kind of know-nothing hard-headedness, uh, we somehow yeah. Um, put ourselves, um, we, just, we just can't grant <laughs> that uh, the creative freedom which is at the center of the arts uh, is a valuable thing. Um, meanwhile, where do the kids from Chinese schools and Korean schools want to come to study? It's in America. Why? because it's recognized that somehow we know how to release creativity. Uh, it drives our sort of entrepreneurial society. We know how it, and yet we look at our scores. Um, actually, Laura and Zucker and I were, a number of us were at a conference where a speaker was saying, you know, when uh, Sputnik, uh, our scores were so much lower than the Russians and they introduced, MIT had to invent PSSC physics, which meant my generation learned nothing about physics, and the, and the new math, so you couldn't learn to add. Um, <laughs> then the Japanese uh, took our steel industry and our car industry, and our scores were terrible, and we said, raise the scores. And somehow we got over that, and we went on. Um, well, the speaker made the point that if we ever really succeeded in raising those scores, we probably would have succeeded in killing uh, the freedom uh, that, our, that the creativity of our society is based on. Now, that doesn't say we're not going to have kids who can read and write. But it's a much more complicated picture. And we sort of, um, we've bought into what's really a quite, quite materialist economic yeah. model yeah. Well, this is, that says nothing that you can't weigh and put a price on. Uh, is valuable, yeah. uh, and of course, once you say, once you sort of tacitly accept that, you've thrown out the arts. Yeah. And there's a huge movement right now in Washington, in the Department of Education, to uh, narrow as much as possible college education to basic job skills. Yes, uh, they actually are proposing to, be tra to really to, tr to train for jobs which may or may not even be there in ten years versus trying to, to create, I mean, it seems to me that the purpose of education is really quite simple. It is to take uh, an, an individual uh, and develop their talents as abundantly as possible so they can lead a productive life in a complicated and even somewhat unpredictable society. Increasingly unpredictable. Yeah. You know, how the hell are you gonna do that, you know, if you're basically training them for entry-level jobs, uh, you know, that, that uh, may not even be around but see, there's another thing about the, about about. Let me just pick okay, up that please. and then go on. Yeah. And it, it's it's just something you all need to gather to fight. I mean, because it's actually pre it's the Democrats now proposing it, not just the Republicans, that we actually judge the worth of student loans essentially by the first year salary of students as they graduate. That means, of course, if you're in the arts where you have to make your career out of nothing, uh, that you're automatically disqualified. If you're in the liberal arts. Uh, you can't win at that game. What we're talking about is a system that says what we really want is undergraduate business majors and undergraduate uh, sort of pre-architecture. We want to we want to push professional school down uh, to 18-year-olds in some fashion, and we'll judge our and that's actually out there. Why stop at 18? Exactly. <laughs> Go on. I interrupted you. No, no, no. I was actually going to build on something you you said, which is you know about the development of self-worth. But the, another thing that happens is that. If you're 13, you know you like, you may, you know your parents, if you have parents, you say, well, I like my parents, but they're, I really can't lead the, their life. I'm trying to figure out who you are. Uh, and so you start looking around for models of who you are. You know, our schools right now say you can be an A student, you can be a jock. Uh, 
Or you can be a druggie, you can be a gangbanger, you can be all these other things which are, you know. now most kids are not jocks and they're not A students. Uh, so you've got about 80% of the kids that really don't have an institutional option. I don't believe that educational success is achieved by pushing everybody through one or two doors. You have to have different doors to success. And we've closed this off. And then what happens is this. I went to uh, a high school on Van Ness and Compton Boulevard. Really rough neighborhood. Uh, I was in the band. My, my fellow band members were all to the man. It was an all boys Catholic school. Mem potential members of the criminal class. I mean, you know, I mean they, were the, you know, they were the dirty two dozen. And somehow, though, by giving them a drum, a trumpet, and, you know, and other instruments with which they could do this, they, they channeled that energy uh, into something that was a kind of, the kind of slow tra self-transcendence that you achieve when you're mastering an art. But also, what do you do in a band? You listen to each other. You play together. It gave them a model of positive socialization. And groups in my school that didn't get along got along in band and formed friendships in, in band. At, at the theater is even more so, and that was great because girls came in. So that had advantages that I, I don't even begin to tell you about. Uh, you know, in all of you know, the school paper, the school, and these things, as they, you cut them away, you not only cut the realization that Steve was talking about in terms of individual uh, self-worth and individual identity, but you make kids less capable of having a positive social identity and le learning positive social skills, which they are not learning in front of, in, by playing video games, uh, you know, and things like this. So I think we have a, sort of a double disaster in this. And we're doing this at a time where we now have to tell our kids that they will have 14 major, an average, 14 major job shifts in their life and four significant career shifts altogether. And then we want to design a school system where you're supposed to, at 18, yeah. Uh, identify what's the career path and uh, and proceed down it. The other factor in this is the arts are everywhere in our youth culture. Um, this is the sort of untapped asset. If you ask what's going on in those earphones, it's listening to music. Um, now it's, it's listening to music and watching video and editing and using Photoshop simultaneously. Um, our, our kids are, are there without us. Um, by and large, I mean, some are self-disciplining yeah. and that turns into, I mean, there will be this generation, we're, we're already seeing kids who will bypass college altogether. They will put together their educations in the absence of us offering them yeah. one. And they will make successes out of their self-education. Um, we see it already in the art students we accept into Cal Arts that they've had to self-educate. That it's it's not that someone's uh, <laughs> it, it, it's not that it's been offered in their schools. They just have found it and gone for it and had the will uh, to to stick it out. Um, so so you have kids who are ready for it, who are hungry for it. You've got the availability of the technology. Uh, it's, it's, it just should be a no-brainer. And yet our very smart superintendent, who could end up as, if Obama's elected as, you know, a cabinet member, um, is, is enacting the same mistake that, that systems are making all over the country. Um, in the name of practical decision making. Um, and if we move beyond you know, education and just into communities, uh, you know, which is, dis or, you know, it's interesting, I, nobody talked about communities about 25 years ago because we actually had them. <laughs> uh, but as communities fell away, you know, you, you could no longer say city and imply by a city that there was a community. You could no longer say, you know, so now we have it, we've brought this term in. But it's, it, it, we do it because it's a meaningful term. It's something that we feel the lack or the presence of anywhere we live. And if, we, if we're trying to create communities which are viable, which is to say people want to live in them, businesses want to locate in them, people who have a choice as to where they live will choose them, uh, you have to, uh, in a sense, have the creative class, to use another term which didn't exist 25 years ago, 
be part of that. And so, you know, once again, if you look at the social vision that man does not live by bread alone, that you, you have to, in a sense, create uh, the, the, the ways of, of delight, of self-realization, of serious engagement with things, and the, and the people that, that attract. So, so, you know, to me, part of any philanthropies, unless it's a very narrowly focused one, agenda should be, as, you know, to use an old-fashioned term rather than a newfangled, things of the spirit. Uh, you, know, the, you know, those things, uh, the presence or the absence of those in a community, in a school, uh, in an education, make the difference between something that, that succeeds in developing someone in the fullness of their human potential or simply reducing them to a potential entry-level employee or p permanently unemployed. Uh, and, I, and, I, and so I think that you know, we live in a society, and we know this. Uh, those of you who are interested in the arts, you live in, we live in a society which does not recognize the importance of what we believe in. Those of us who know the fundamental transcendence, uh, the transfiguration that has happened in our own lives because of those encounters, that is not acknowledged in our society, in our political system, or our educational system. And that leadership, like it or not, you can, you can moan and groan all you want about Washington and Sacramento, must come from the public sector, the private sector. We must, we must take the leadership in terms of articulating that, funding these things, and demonstrating their effectiveness. Because if we do not do it, if we do not take leadership in this, you know, we can wait till doomsday uh, you know, for the public sector to do this. And I say that as a person who ran the uh, Arts Agency of the United States for seven years. Uh, you know, and, you know, we, we, even at the NEA, could only work effectively in partnership, you know, with the private sector. Uh, the public sector, you know, we had to sort of drag along, you know, subsidize. I mean, I can't tell you how many times uh, I had to have acrimonious and sustained negotiations with state legislatures who were eliminating their state arts agency. I had to threaten withholding public funds. I had to resist the pressure of their state senators. And I, you know, and I had to, in a sense, uh, it, you know, invoke a statutory ability I had to hold back federal funds. And then, grudgingly, they would vote in the minimum. Uh, but the private sector is the sector which is going to either take leadership in this or it's not going to happen and it will only get worse. And, I, and I, it's a good, because this actually brings us to the subject of, of philanthropy uh, pretty directly. Um, I was looking at this, the, this new report that's come out on the philanthropy 50, uh, of which the arts are a very small piece. Um, and the 1% the and the 99% is in significant ways being acted out in the arts right now. Um, the, the number of large-scale gifts is not in decline. Organizations that depend on modest donors are, are dying on the vine. In fact, the arts for the last since 2001, but especially since 2008, it gets a little like the perils of Pauline. Uh, they're up this week, they're down the uh, Philadelphia Orchestra. I mean, a, a, a once great orchestra, maybe still a great orchestra. Uh, is it gonna live to tomorrow? Is it not? Um, and when you look at where the rescues come, it ends up being, you know, it ends up being Eli Broad rescuing Mocha. Someone who can make a $30 million gift. Um, again and again, it is a single donor. Yep. Now, single donors have always played a huge role in the institutional arts, but because of the skewing in our society, it is a larger and larger role uh, that carries with it um, a problem that one Holly Sitford writes about in the report that came out, uh, came out recently on, well, how'd you call it, uh, arts, culture, and social change or whatever. Um, despite the, the work of expansion arts program of NEA over yeah. many years to build an infrastructure at community level, um, those organizations are all working below their capacity. 
uh, for lack of support, uh, and they are not going to attract um, the billionaire donor. Uh, they're, not, they're not glamorous, that needs tending. It's about the building of community. Um, there, are, there are major jobs to be done that very little money could do. And we're talking about organizations that operate with what, a four hundred to eight hundred thousand yeah. dollar a year budget um, that are essential not only in the social life of communities, but I mean, maybe this is a romanticized view, but uh, for me in the marketplace of democracy, um, the sort of de Tocqueville vision, uh, unless voices are heard uh, from every sector, there's no way to get the democracy right. Uh, and you say, well, how are those voices going to, where are they going to acquire the skills in this noisy society to make the voices heard that let us understand what's actually going on? Yeah. Um, and that's a combination of what goes on in schools and what goes on in neighborhood centers. Yeah. And now we, we've talked a lot about the gloomy stuff. I got um, more gloomy stuff for later. Yeah, no, we, 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 we have, I think we both have a lot in reserve, <laughs> you know. But, you know, there, another interesting thing about being, chairing the NEA and going to, you know, I mean, I spent seven years every week pretty much. I was traveling with a senator, a congressman, a governor, a cabinet member, something all over the country. And you have a, a real sense of what's going on in the country. The, and you see right away cities in which things are working and cities in which they're not working. Uh, and, you know, and a really uh, characteristic uh, quality of the cities which are really quite successful in doing this, and I don't want to give you a list because it's, you know, but I'll give, just give you one. Minneapolis, St. Paul. This has been an extraordinary story of a, you know, and, and I think what it really happened was that in about 1930, the rich corporate leaders of Minnesota got together and said, we don't want our kids and grandkids moving somewhere else. I think it was that tribal. And it was a bunch of basically Norwegians and Jews that just said, you know, we want to make a city that our families stay in. And they, they created a sort of a tithe for the corporate leaders. They created an infrastructure where they did this, and year after year they supported it. The arts organizations work together in this. And if you look at this, you know, now, you know, 60 years later, it's extraordinary. It is really quite extraordinary. I mean, everything from the Walker to Garrison Keillor, uh, you know, has come out of this commitment. I mean, the, it, you know, what's the best public radio outside of, you know, Washington, D.C.? It's Minneapolis. You know, you look at, the, uh, they've got theater, symphony, opera, arts, dance, you know, literary centers, uh, you know, my own, you know, the, I, I publish with two presses. One I make a lot of money on, which is a commercial press, and one publishes the things that really matter, which is a nonprofit press, which is Grey Wolf Press, which was in Was the state of Washington. Minnesota, they were doing the things that, you know, we need a, a really good press here. So about 20 years they went to my publisher and said, if you move there, 12 months later we'll support you. And he did, and it's now uh, one of the two largest boutique presses in the United States. Uh, distributed by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, run by uh, the one of the former editors at Faber and Faber in London. And, and they've done this because, because really they had a vision of their community in which the arts were one of the things that would make the town attractive, creative, and productive. Uh, and they worked together. And a, and a recognition that that took infrastructure not just the Tyrone Guthrie Theater. Yeah. It took a deeper infrastructure because actors had to be willing to stay in Minneapolis. You couldn't, you couldn't survive on waiting for your one cycle through the, through the Guthrie Theater yeah. each year. Uh, the literary culture is, is, a, is a places like the loft yeah. and these whole buildings supporting small literary organizations as a result, bookstores surviving to yeah. and small. Which you give you know, and they're very good about giving people in various arts in, in, you know, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, a place to go to, you know, where they find their community, where they find their tribe. And, and, and but, what I, but the reason I'm saying this is it was really a kind of common effort. There's not a foundation in that town that doesn't, in, to a greater or lesser extent, participate in that. 
And year after year, it has you know, made this different from all of the other dying cities on the Great Plains. This is a city which is very healthy economically, demographically, and culturally. And to, to bring this sort of home close to us, in many ways, this is one of the failures of Los Angeles. Um, Los Angeles has failure? I love failure. I just, <laughs> I just gravitate toward it. Um, we understand the role of what some people want to call leadership organizations and have done, in a way, quite a good job. I mean, certainly with the Philharmonic, uh, with LACMA, uh, MOCA has its perils, but it survives. Um, we haven't thought nearly adequately about the infrastructure that actually supports arts careers that end up there uh, as opposed to being there. Um, visual arts prospers because visual arts, by and large, actually live in the for-profit world, not in the not-for-profit world. And so a gallery structure over, it took a long time, but has grown up uh, and now is self-sustaining. Uh, architecture thrives because we build a lot. Um, but you say, what have we done for dance in this city? Well, finally, we have dance at the Music Center. We have, we have a, a large-scale presenter. But it is almost impossible to sustain a dance company in Los Angeles. Um, with very little money in changing priorities, we could sustain that world. Um, what's sustaining it now, and it's another feature of Los Angeles that is inadequately understood, is it's actually the college structure here that does more than, if you say, what sustains literary life in Los Angeles? The writers are employed by the universities. Uh, we don't have a, we have, we have a growing small press world, but. Uh, the, the, but probably still, the biggest literary press in Los Angeles is probably Red Hand, which just barely struggles along. In fact, if the mayor of Pasadena had not given them free rent, they would probably have moved, you know, moved elsewhere. But, you know, they're very, very underfunded. So, so there, is, there is an infrastructure issue there. Um, when, when, when I came to Los Angeles, I, I would hear it from our, our graduates in dance, in new media, in more experimental branches of theater, that they had to leave Los Angeles. That there simply was, you, you got one shot. It was lace or highways. You got some little shot, or a university would present you once a year. Yeah. And then you had to leave, because there was just no way to, to conduct the career here. Um, in starting Red Cat, we were making the kind of intervention that a college can make, but it takes a lot more than that to do it. Um, I've always wondered why um, these are such small amounts of money that would, that would foster that life in Los Angeles. Uh, why not more has been done uh, to foster it? So I just throw it out as a challenge. Okay. Um. Well, there's a lot there to um, respond to, react to, to question. Um, but the fact that you sort of gotten, got to the point of talking about Los Angeles, we have a lot of experts I'll that say. work in the arts, supporting the arts here in LA. So maybe they have some questions or ideas or suggestions. Just sort of introduce yourself really yeah, briefly. Please do. And if your question is succinct and the answers are reasonably succinct, we can get to more people. Dana and I don't do this succinct. I, I, I see that. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that I want to uh, pick up on is what you were just saying, Steve, actually, and something that James, that, uh, James alluded to earlier. Um, I there, a few weeks ago, some people may have read the Pablo Eisenberg piece in the Chronicle of Philanthropy about priorities of our philanthropists, and he was singling out someone who had uh, put up $7.5 million, I believe, to restore the Washington Monument uh, to, so that people can visit it again. And he was you know, sort of talking about how this is so misguided and what's our problem when we've got so many issues, you know, particularly in a city like DC, 
when he's funding all, funneling all this money to, to sort of correct this problem. So it was, you know, he got a lot of flack for it and, you know, for a good reason. But at the same time, he's bringing up a point that I think is really important that is what you just said, Steve, that like look at what it would take to, you know, the small areas that would help to foster this community that we're talking about and sort of build this infrastructure. And we're doing other things, which is great, but how do we, how do we sort of get everyone on board without telling everyone what to do and how to do it in terms of philanthropy and, and the arts? Just, just two thoughts of them. Um, one, I mean, I, I used to be more radical than I am now. Uh, now I accept we need all parts of the infrastructure. We need the Washington Monument to survive as well. Um, it's just that with the skewing of wealth in society, in some ways, there is someone to give $60 million all at once to replace the plaza in front of the Metropolitan Museum, um, to have better fountains, basically. Uh, that's great. It's a great museum. It couldn't be a great museum if people didn't give the money to make the you know, Islamic galleries great galleries. Um, but in a way, we're structured pretty well right now to take care of uh, the large scale uh, organizations. Um, the sort of organizations that are big enough so that if you were a person of big wealth, it seems like it's analogous enough. Uh, it's the parts of the infrastructure below that that in this skewing of wealth, I think are, are increasingly fragile. Uh, and so the, the general picture I would offer is the value of actually looking at how one has a life in the arts from childhood upward, um, and then what, what are the things that, that help sustain that uh, in a place? Uh, now I'm going to say this the opposite. Um, when, I, when I worked at the Rockefeller Foundation, Howard Klein was our wise person in the arts. Um, and he said, you can't make anything happen with philanthropy. What you can do is take something that is happening and help it happen at a bigger scale. Well, right now, by and large in the arts, uh, we don't nationally or locally um, have foundations who feel it's within their right to declare something is happening, uh, to make what are actually more subjective judgments about what's, what's important on a developmental basis. Uh, and uh, I don't know how we get to that, because that goes against the way we, what we tell foundations, you know, be responsible, judge your results, all that. Um, the Ford Foundation made a bet on, uh, what's, the, what's the Harlem Ballet, the studio, give me the, do you support them? Harlem Studio Dance Company? Which one? The, the major African American ballet Alvin company Ailey? in, uh, Alvin in Alvin Ailey? No. I'm sorry? Dance Studio of Harlem. Excuse me, sorry, a lapse. Dance Studio of Harlem. There was a moment when the Ford Foundation, with basically with a million dollars willed it into existence from nothing, because they felt it had to happen. Uh, right now, we treat that as if that would be an abuse by a foundation to, to let something radical happen. Um, I sort of miss the days where that was seen as a, a glory of foundation work, that you would place a bet on something that seemed like it would institutionally lead to large-scale change but wasn't an existing need. Uh, we, it's easy to say we have too many not-for-profit organizations already. We can't afford them. Uh, starting a new one is seen as kind of sinful. Uh, and yet, we, we need yeah. bets that let fundamental things still happen uh, in the arts and culture in our society. I'm sorry, I went on too long. No, I, actually, I think you answered it adequately. So, you know, the only thing I would add is that um, I think Washington provides a lot of bad examples uh, almost nowhere more so than in philanthropy, uh, which is so often tied there to political access 
and uh, sort of immediate social status. Um, and so, you know, I think that, um, you know, I don't think that's where we should be looking to for wisdom. Uh, Laura Zucker uh, with the Los Angeles County Arts Commission. I feel like I'm living in an alternate reality from you guys. Maybe it's because I represent the county that provides the largest support for the arts of any government agency, county in the United States. But I see funders working together in a pooled fund for arts education. I see people making extraordinary investments. The Board of Supervisors guaranteeing a $14 million loan for the opera. You know, it's crazy. We have a lot of great things happening in LA and a, a lot of wonderful things happening from the funders who are in this room. Could you talk a little bit about the plus side? Yeah. Well, you know, we were, I, I was at least talking, I think Steve was too, largely from a national perspective. And in a, in a national perspective, uh, I think the, the, the trends are inarguable. Uh, and, you know, it is not, I don't think either of our ambitions to depress people, but I do think that w whatever the funding is, uh, you know, locally, it's probably somewhat inadequate, uh, you know, to the needs. Ask a local librarian. Uh, and and I, I understand all of the reasons. Uh, I could have taken a job almost anywhere. I was, people were very generous with me. People were, you know, I was offered, all kinds of things. I came to Los Angeles for two reasons. Uh, I came, one is it's my hometown. This is where I was raised. I love this city. Uh, but secondly, it's my judgment right now of any city in the United States, Los Angeles is the most interestingly culturally vital city in North America. Uh, the only rival, seriously, is New York. New York has inarguable greatness. It is these tremendous institutions, uh, but they are, for the most part, fully formed. And New York's resources are simply to, to maintain this extraordinary cultural infrastructure that it has of the, the Metropolitan Opera, Lincoln Center, the Metro, you know, MoMA, et cetera, et cetera. Los Angeles is, is a city which is developing, and it's developing in a way which uh, there are no historical parallels. You know, it is becoming the 21st century global creative capital. Nobody, even in this room, uh, uh, understands exactly whatever f final form that will take, but it's exciting. And everybody in this town can feel it. Uh, that being said, I do not believe that we have created the infrastructure in this town uh, in in education or in a sense the art, the art institutions uh, to fully realize the potential that this historical moment gives us of this great city facing the Pacific between North America, Latin America, and Asia, which is the capital of global electronic culture as well as a center of extraordinary intellectual capital. Uh, and I think that the, our, where we could be and where we are, there is a gap at almost every level that you realize. There are a few institutions you know, which are, I think, well-funded. But I think that, as, you know, as, you know, as Steve mentioned, there's whole sectors which I think uh, don't seem to be facing this. So you know, to, the de if I, to, to the degree that I, I sound critical of LA, it's because I am uh, a, an LA patriot. I believe in this town's future. I believe in what's happening here. And I be believe that what we need to do is call ourselves liable uh, for the full capacity of our destiny. And, and, that, and I don't that, feel that's, that. That's a, that's a very beautiful way to put it, the full capacity of our destiny. I agree completely about um, basically Manhattan became too expensive to be a generative center. I mean, the real estate became too, artists can't be there. Uh, you have to go further and further. From and same things happened to San Francisco. Same for San Francisco. Um, look, San, New York keeps a disproportionate place because it's a publishing center. It's a curatorial center. It's still where judgments are formed. Uh, 
uh, the, people don't go to the Los Angeles, I mean, I love the, in its own way the Los Angeles Times, but people don't go to the Los Angeles Times for the definitive judgments on things. Uh, dance companies are still have to go to New York to get their New York Times review to use that with funders to go on and seek further support. Um, so it has that and, and the visibility that goes with that. Um, and still, despite the contraction of publishing, lots of, lots of magazines and journals that favored the sort of cultural action of New York as their subject matter. Um, there is no city, part of the reason that Los Angeles has thrived in the visual arts, is there is nowhere in the world that has Art Center College of Design, USC, UCLA, UC Irvine, CalArts, and Otis. And now there are other places as well. Uh, the wealth of, of that entering the visual arts here is, it's astonishing. It was a long time before the artists could stay here to have their careers, but, it, but it's happened. Yeah. Uh, we have strong dance programs, not as rich as the dance programs in New York uh, training, but spread through the universities to Long Beach and Irvine and UCLA and CalArts. And I don't know, do they have, do they have dance at USC? I don't know. Um, UC Riverside. UC Riverside. Um, so again, we have, we have the sort of feeder organizations. I think it was Pew which did the study of eight, Laura will know this, uh, did a study of eight major cities in the United States and concluded that the only one where the, where the universities were the fundamental infrastructure uh, was Los Angeles. Uh, that the others, the infrastructure existed in other kinds of organizations um, and then attracted people to take advantage yeah, of Let me develop one thing you said, which I think needs to be said even more clearly. Uh, if you wanted to say what was one really unbelievably humongous uh, absence in Los Angeles, it is an absence of arts criticism. Uh, if something interesting happens here, there's a good chance nobody will uh, note it. Nobody will discuss it. Uh, nobody will argue over it. I mean, what I love about, I, mean, I lived in New York for 20 years. What I love about New York is people think opera, literature, dance, uh, you know, painting, everything is so serious that they will argue about it, issue after issue. It's important. Here, uh, you know, we are still, uh, in deference to New York as the thing that forms the opinion. What, what do we think about ourselves? Well, let's ask a New Yorker. Uh, and I think that, that LA needs to develop uh, not just a critical sensibility, but to record, to celebrate, uh, to become conscious of it. You know, I, I'm a, enough of a Marxist that I believe uh, in, a, in a, a, a fundamental Marxist principle, which is that consciousness uh, precedes change. It is, as a people, as a society, as a class becomes conscious of what it does, this gives them, in a sense, the, the awareness to create the future. The creative class in Los Angeles, not the movie business, not the popular music business, which, are, which have that kind of thing, but the rest of them, we don't have that level of self-awareness, self-criticism uh, to really, uh, I think, achieve the next level. And, and, I mean, the, the, the brilliance of Pacific Standard Time has, has been um, that there was so much we didn't know. Exactly. The <laughs> Ann Philbin show at, at the Hammer. Uh, who knew what a track of African-American artists had? And Ann told me that when they, when they decided to do that show, they didn't know whether it'd be a good show or not. No one was paying attention. They, Individuals had risen to start. If I can lower the tone, uh, Jim Cuno told me something very funny. He says, Pacific Standard Time, he says, it's great. He says, I didn't have to do any of the work and I get all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew that Pomona had played the role it played? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that was all stuff that, that if we owned it in ourselves, uh, it'd be a lot better for the Pacific life of the Standard city. Time is a historic, uh, change in Los Angeles consciousness. But we need that as an ongoing enterprise 
uh, across the arts. But I do think that that's, I mean, just to name one thing, because I don't, uh, however much pride we take in the, in, I say this as, as a pu former public official to a current public official, however much pride we take in what we're doing, I don't think we want to say that we're, you know, uh, you know, what's the, what's the line that Faust promises never to say the devil? Verweile doch, du bist so schön. You know, that we're so happy in this moment that we don't have to move forward. And, uh, and what interests me is, is, is the next decade, the next two decades that it, in this town, which could be amazing in the way that Venice was at once amazing, that Florence was once amazing. Uh, that Paris was once amazing, that London was once amazing in terms of these, of these, these, deca these decades or, or, or half centuries of creative renaissance or efflorescence that truly defined the arts of that epoch internationally. And LA is one of the few places in the world where you say that could happen. It not only has the potential, but it's in the very character of the city. Uh, and the question is, just like you take a, a kid who doesn't know who he or she wants to be at 13, and if you find the way of awakening them to the, to the possibilities of their own destiny, they might actually amaze you. If we could find a way of making the city recognize the potential of its collective identity, you know, I, I do think that we, we would have something you know, that would be you know, part of the, of the world history of culture happening here. As somebody who grew up in Minneapolis with the Tyrone Guthrie Theater and the Walker Art Center, I would say that what distinguishes Minneapolis from LA is that LA is a very heterogeneous city and a young city. And Minneapolis benefited from being very homogenous, um, lots of Norwegians, and, uh, and having long-standing corporate presence of Cargill, 3M, you know, as you, exactly as you said. I was struck recently by a conversation with somebody at the Actors Fund that the origin of the Actors Fund, much to my, I was really stunned to learn. Can you hold the microphone just a little closer? I'm sorry? Yeah, it's right In the 1880s, the Actors Fund was established as a funeral fund for performing artists who could not be buried in consecrated ground. And my colleague, uh, Keith McNutt, who went to work there 10 years ago, said 100 years later, in the midst of the AIDS epidemic, we had moved no, we'd made no progress, and that he was arguing with funeral parlors to bury actors who had died of AIDS. So as a culture, you know, I think Americans are deeply puritanical. We don't like, we like the art and we don't like artists. And, but I think what LA has going for it is LA has always bucked trends. And, um, and I think that philanthropy ultimately will play less of a role here then new kinds of vehicles and donor uh, activity, you know, Kickstarter, U.S. artist projects, and actually in Minneapolis Tribune this past week at crowdsourcing is becoming a whole new, the Minneapolis Orchestra actually has turned to crowdsourcing to commission artists for new, so it's happening in Minneapolis too. So I'm actually very hopeful that I don't put a huge stake in, you know, we don't have, we don't have the philanthropy that New York and Boston and Minneapolis have. We don't have foundations that are 100 years old. We will in 50 years, but we don't yet. And so it's, it'll happen differently here. And so like Laura, I actually have a lot of hope that we don't have a lot of muscle power philanthropically, but I think people in LA vote with their feet and they vote with their own pocketbooks. I, did I, do I sound not hopeful? No, no but I just think yeah. it's a really different. I just think well, no, it is. The, all, all, these cities, all these cities are different. And you know, Minneapolis, I used as an example because it's, it is a simple example relative to Los Angeles. Although I'll say something about, once again, about to go back to the critical point. I, I lived this summer in Minneapolis. I listened to, to Minneapolis Public Radio. Every day I heard detailed arts coverage. I knew every play that was playing, every concert that was playing, you know, you know, every art exhibit and things like that. And there, you know, and there is an investment in terms of the consciousness of the city, which I don't think would be misplaced in a city even as complex as Los Angeles. You may need five or six times, you know, you know those things. And and I would say the other Maybe it's because I've, I've been president of college for 24 years now. I, I, I can't excuse us any longer because we're young. We're not so young. Um, uh, we keep losing pieces of ourselves. I mean, that was, again, the lesson of Pacific Standard Time. Not that stuff hadn't happened in Los Angeles, 
but that it had happened and we forgot. We just didn't, we just didn't see it there. And if you don't claim uh, in some more general way what you, what you have done, then you are always a kid. Then you're always waiting for somebody to get to the to the the next step. Yeah, it's, it's such a, we, I, have, we have a yeah. profound musical history in Los Angeles. I, I edited a really comprehensive anthology called California Poetry, from the Gold Rush to the present. The interesting thing for me was that there was never any documentation available on a Los Angeles poet. None. I remember you it, said that no journals that survived yeah, yeah, more than yeah, a few yeah, you years. Know, but I, I couldn't even get their death dates sometimes without you know you know going into the L.A. Times morgue, uh, and so it's you know it. Uh, but I agree. I'm, you know, I was born in L.A. My mom was born in L.A. L.A. is not a young city to me. It's been around for a long time. In the twenties, uh, creative people from all over the world came here. That's nearly a century ago. Now maybe our our formal philanthropical community is young you know, relative to other places. But you know, shouldn't, ad shouldn't young adults and teenagers be more feisty? I'm Ruth Eliel, I'm the executive director of the Colburn Foundation. And I'm an optimist by nature, so I don't want to gainsay anything that either Laura or Clara said. But going back to what Dana was talking about earlier, about the kind of music education he had in his school in Hawthorne, even though it wasn't exactly the richest part of the city, um, it strikes me that there is this 99%, 1% thing going on in the arts, just as there is in society. And um, for example, we have the fantastic YOLA program here in Los Angeles, which is not only teaching a lot of kids about music, but teaching a lot of kids about cooperation and working together and all those things that you were talking about, Dana. Um, and yet I know that the heart of LA, which is one of the YOLA sites, struggles to raise its share of the money to support this program that has gotten enormous publicity, not just locally, but nationally. Um, you know, I can tell you any number of, because we, we're big, what we do is support music and music education and, and training of musicians in this, in this region. Um, I can talk about any number of organizations, and they're not the ones who are in the paper every day, yeah. um, who are really struggling to make ends meet. Um, and it's no longer just about the downturn or the recession. Um, I think it really is because there's not enough attention being paid. Yeah. No, th thank, so you for, thank you for saying that. Because uh, let me, if I could say that, you know, I, I've talked to many, many hundreds of groups over the last, you know, uh, eight, nine years. I mean, you know, literally almost every day sometimes. And there's two things that go on when we talk about problems. You know, one is that people say they recognize that there are problems but there are also people who say, you know, I'm doing really important work. I'm doing valuable work. Isn't it to say, talk about a problem devaluing that? No, because all of us are involved in things which are really working. You know, we're giving a time, we're giving attention, we're giving money to things that we, we visibly, tangibly see working. And I don't mean to devalue any of that. But what I'm simply trying to say is what, what you're saying is that we, we, if we look around, we also see where those things are absent. And, and, and there needs to be more of that investment, more of the dedication. And what seeing the things work should do for us is give us the conviction of our own intuition, that these things are of inestimable human value. And, and again, it's a, a piece of this is claiming what's already here. It's, it's not an accident that people, again, I started with Asia, but it's not an accident that all these Asian art students want to, want to be in, it's, uh, they, it's not New York they go to, it's actually Los Angeles and San Francisco where they're coming in large numbers. Or that all the, the German Jews in World War II, you know, you know, the late 30s you know, came here, that the Russian emigres came here, that you know, Octavio Paz, the great poet of Me Mexico, the only Mexican who's ever won the Nobel Prize in literature, was a teenager in Los Angeles. In, in I mean, some ways, this has always been a center. And in, in some ways, others are better at seeing us than we are at reflecting back at ourselves. Um, part of that, again, has to do with the limited amount of media that devotes attention uh, to the whole of, of what's here. I was just, uh, I'm Louise Bryson, and um, I just wanted to say something about Pacific Standard Time that I thought was very powerful. 
and hasn't been said so far, was that everybody worked together. There's a huge amount of money that went into really the uh, process of getting every organization. And when we talked about museums, we talked about the fundraisers coming together and trading names. Now, when you get to that point, you're really talking about something bigger. Mm -hmm. That's why I agree on building on this, because part of it is a way of talking about ourselves. We're different. We don't have to compete. In fact, if we do things together and we reach down to Orange County with Henry, um, you know, who never worked with Los Angeles, because we said, let's talk about this as a whole. Southern California, let's not try to divide this up. We're, we're stronger. And one other thing I want to say about the superintendent. He's working like crazy. He said when he came in, I don't want a contract. You can fire me if I'm not doing the right job. So I want to really support him because I think if he has to take the art out of the schools, then we have to, as a group, do the same thing we did with Pacific Standard Time. We can't be individuals. We have to get together, and we have to have the will to say, we're going to help you. And that means every museum which has an educational program, the music center which has an educational program, the universities can all help. The studios can help kids to show them what they can do. So I think there's a will. And I think we have to start talking about the will, and we have to start with the young people. Just like you've said, you got to start with a K through, you know, all the way up. So I am sort of want to be inspired <laughs> to say, you know, let's get this going in all our organizations, and let's work together. We've already built something, and we can keep building it. So. Would Although I, I would say one of the inspired things about Pacific Standard Time is it, it'll, it was cooperation and still allowed all the organizations to be self-interested. Mm -hmm. exactly. Pomona got to claim its unique right. legacy. It didn't ask them to collaborate in a way that they would wash out their difference. It let them claim their difference. Uh, and that was, that's usually when people think of cooperation, uh, they want institutions to give up uh, the sort of self-interested things they need to do to advance their own missions. And that's doomed to fail. We all have to fight for our own institutions. It's what we're, what we're hired to do is fight for our own institutions. But one, if one can come up with a sort of simultaneity in the cooperation where we, we each get stronger in the process and yet the system works better, then you really got something. Yeah. I, I think everything you said is just on the money. Uh, I, would, I would only add one thing is that, you know, one of the interesting things about this problem is that all the pieces to solving it are in place. This city is full of not unemployed artists, but underutilized artists, underemployed artists, people who would willingly uh, become involved in any scheme that we thought up, you know. Uh, and you know, and the interesting thing about Pacific Standard Time, this is true, you know, back you know, back east when I when I've talked to people about it, is they're sort of astonished at the range and depth of arts organizations in, in, in the LA area. They didn't realize there were that many organizations, and so I, you know, but I but I think it's this is the real thing is what's next? What can we do of comparable scope and ambition? Maybe a, a, in a different, across different arts or whatever, you know, to keep this kind of energy going. There's a hand right here. Oh, back there. Sorry. Hi, um, Jim Hur with the Boeing Company, and um, this is the part where I'm glad I'm sitting in the back because I'll probably get run out of the room. <laughs> um, uh, so just be gentle with me if you catch up to me. Um, so I'll preface it by saying I, I really do have the utmost respect for for the gentlemen on the panel and, and everyone in this room. Um, I'm a novice at this. I, I don't, as much as I would love to have the arts as my full-time portfolio, it's only part of it. Um, I haven't spent a lifetime in Los Angeles, but it is a city that I love very, very, very much. Um, 
so uh, to talk about the education piece, just real quickly, you had mentioned that you know the federal government's trying to, and I'm paraphrasing you terribly, track college students into careers that'll get them into business and into science, engineering, math. I actually don't have a problem with it if the government actually knew what business needed, and they don't. So that that's the first part. Um, the second part, you know, with relation to arts in LA, I you know I came home from the movie Saturday night like at 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning, and it was another movie featuring people with British accents, as most movies have been the past year, and then the entertainment industry wonders why it's not making any money. I came home, I took the dogs out for a walk, and there's a mariachi band playing at 1 o'clock in the morning in my neighborhood, echoing through the canyon, and I'm thinking, really, 1 o'clock in the morning? And then I thought, you know, I could be living in New York and I could be putting up with sirens and people <laughs> screaming and cabs blowing their horns and God knows what else going on. I have a mariachi band. I think I'll take the mariachi band. But my point is that we've set up institutions, art institutions in LA with a capital A that don't reflect what the rest of Los Angeles is like. They've set barriers of education. You have to understand the arts of money, you have to be able to pur purchase tickets or purchase the art. Quite frankly, this room does not reflect the demographics of Los Angeles. I think most of the people in Los Angeles now are people of color. And I think that's where it's sort of the disconnect is coming in because as much as I don't want MoCA to go away and, and, and thankful that Eli Brode can ride in on his white horse with $30 million, I think how much that $30 million could do in all those small little community rec rooms where kids are learning Filipino dance or you know, Thai painting or any other part of the really rich, diverse culture that we have in Los Angeles that makes us unique and that is what's going to define the art 50, 60 years from now unless it just falls apart because we're not doing anything to support it now. So well, I, I think you're saying more or less what we were saying yeah. about uh, the, the sort of skewing of our society has left the large-scale institutions in a pretty good position to, to foster their future. Um, that there's a whole other, basically everything else in the society has much harder issues to face in terms of how it will be supported and it seems to me it's one of the places where, where foundation philanthropy has, a, has an edge. Um, and that's why it's worth talking about it in, in, in this context. But I don't think we're disagreeing with you at all. Yeah, yeah let, me, let me just build it, you know, as, a, as first of all, you know, the, the identity argument, you know, I'm not so sure about. I'm half Mexican and Italian. My wife is Russian and German. My, my, you know, my brother's wife is Saudi and Irish. Uh, my other, my, my, you know, my, uh, you know, brothers, you know, uh, live in, you know, their, their, their his partner is Korean. That's L.A. You know, I mean, it's like we're all mixed together. Uh, if we aren't mixed together yet, we're going to be mixed together in a generation. And we, and the thing about if you're in a family, you got to love each other. You got to take care of each other. And I think if you look at LA and the family, you sort of say, do we want the elite institutions? Of course we want the elite institutions. We want the opera. We want the symphony. We want LACMA. We want LA MOCA. But you can't then say, well, we don't want to take care of everybody else. And what worries me is in LA, as in most of the country right now, arts education is in direct proportion to the parents' income. And uh, and it's, do I want to educate the upper class? Of course I want to educate the upper class, you know? But I don't want to, you know, forget about everybody else. And so, the, so we agree with you. I just want to, you know, you know, but I think it's, the thing is that we want, you, you, the, the arts education and the elite institutions reinforce each other. Uh, but we say one other thing, is, and this is where I would, where Steve and I, I don't know if we'll disagree, but in a sense we're sort of at different ends, which is that the purpose of arts education is not to produce artists. No, we're weird you know, about that. Uh, you know, it's just, that's a byproduct. Unfortunately, some of the kids in theater will decide to be actors. Unfortunately, some of the kids <laughs> will decide to be poets, you know? And, you know, and, and I pity, you know, I got a, a son who, uh, who told me, 
is, you know, th this is the scariest words a father can hear. He goes, my therapist and I agree <laughs> uh, that my self-image is as a writer. And I'm just going, <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, but, you know, but the purpose of arts education is to create complete human beings. And, and not to treat people like cattle, not to treat people like uh, entry-level workers who are going nowhere in their lives. Everybody should entertain the dream of being a dancer or a poet, uh, even if they end up into something you know, rather questionable, like, like a venture capitalist or you know, a heart surgeon. And, so, and, and, that's, and I think that's what we share. But, but we, you know, we have to admit, to think of ourselves as a family. Uh, you know, LA is this family which people keep marrying into. <laughs> keep, cousins keep arriving. Uh, you know, and we're all in it together. You know? We're either going to you know, make something out of it or we're not. I, I, you know, but I, don't, I, don't, don't write out the white people, you know? Uh, you know, because you know, they play a key role too. You know? and, um, worrying is what I do for a living. Uh, I, I would like to give you something else to worry about. Um, you know, we've just seen this great debate go on between Hollywood and um, the internet about whether we would protect intellectual property or whether everything wants to be free and uh, translated for free. Uh, uh, San Francisco won and Los Angeles lost in this, in this uh, congressional debate just now. It was not very well designed legislation, yeah. uh, but um, we had a major setback in terms of defending uh, the intellectual property that people create. Um, this matters. Um, when the internet was, uh, we, we, a couple of you were there, so I apologize for repeating this, but when the internet was invented uh, in those little shacks behind Stanford, um, they had the wherewithal to attach to every bit of information a provenance, so you'd know who owned it. And they chose not to. Um, the long story about why they chose not to, the explanation we heard at a college board meeting recently was that so many of the uh, young computer scientists were growing pot from the heat of the computers, um, <laughs> or else were draft dodgers, that they wanted anonymity to be built into the internet. We're, we're being sold this idea uh, by our futurists right now that if you give everything away, you will become wealthy in the end. Uh, that's become the mantra of our futurist thinkers right now, that you make yourself known you keep giving it away, and then suddenly it'll turn into a reward for you. Um, who knows? Uh, but if you look at the music industry, and you say, under this new dispensation, are, are, are musicians being better fostered because they can circulate their things for free, or not as well fostered because uh, they're not being paid for what they produce in the world, I think you would have to conclude that, in fact, musicians are being disadvantaged, even though there is that rare person who, using the internet, finds a way to sell him or herself to the world. Um, I just offer this because I think it's, this is one of the dramas that's going to play out in our lives right now. Um, and it's going to affect the art world in a profound way, um, uh, that it is almost impossible to own for very long what you create any longer. Someone was explaining to me the other day that part of the reason Hollywood is so high on 3D is it's much harder to pirate, uh, that you can't just video it from the screen and reproduce it immediately. There are other reasons, too, obviously. No, it's, it's I, equally the same for writers. You know, what you can download in Xerox and things like this, you never get paid royalties for. So I, I just. I, I, there's nothing to be said about it, but yeah. I just I would suggest it's something to watch uh, because it, it, it has a potential uh, to actually damage the, the, uh, the creative life of the country in the long run. Okay, we have time for one last question. Uh, yes, uh, we, we know that in the... Uh, 
Yes, in the recession, the 1%, their uh, philanthropy went up, and it went up to um, the very prominent arts organizations that served them, the operas, the museums, the symphonies, and so forth. And my question has to do about a communications piece to that 1%. Is there a way to, uh, and maybe we all need to think about this, but is there a way to craft a communication piece to the 1% which shows them the possibilities of funding grassroots organizations that have a tremendous payoff where they can take the leadership and the leverage in their communities and have a much bigger payoff than, than what they have been doing? Uh, you, know, if, you know, if I can you know, answer that, or be, be begin with, is that you know, one of the things I'm going to was, you know, start at USC in the fall, and you know, Jim you know, has, has been helping me plan this, is a beginning a program on arts leadership and arts entrepreneurship. But I think in a funny way, we have to start with the artists, which is to train them uh, to say, how do you create the life that you want to lead? How do you create a life which allows you to practice your art uh, uh, in a way that is viable? And part of this is how do they, in a sense, meet, cultivate, and communicate with donors, with people to, to, you know, to support them? Because right now in the United States, there's about 100 institutions, I think, that if they are in financial trouble, will automatically be saved. No one is going to let the National Gallery of Art go under. No one's going to let the Metropolitan Art Opera go under. But the other, you know, hundred thousand institutions can easily go bankrupt, and, and uh, you know, unless there's some sort of intervention. But I do think that we, we need to do a better job of of communicating to our artistic leaders, especially younger artists who are, in a sense, entrepreneurs, creating a dancer who wants to create a venue in Los Angeles where they can dance and they can choreograph, how do they, in a sense, reach you know, these people? I don't know, I don't know if it's as, as effective top down. It's interesting because we're, we're, we're developing the same program at, at Cal Arts. I was up in the Bay Area the other day uh, looking at some entrepreneurship programs there. And it brought home how different the culture is in the Bay Area and in Los Angeles. Young filmmaker in Los Angeles says, I want to make my film. A young filmmaker in the Bay Area says, I want to make a scalable company. <laughs> it, is so, it is so in the water there. Yeah. Uh, now, I don't know if it has any better effects. Well, it certainly does well, around, in the, around in Stanford. The, yeah. In the Bay but, Area, there but, are these salons where you literally go to, and there's about you know, six or seven you know, cyber millionaires, billionaires, and, and you sort of present your thing. I mean, I'm always being asked to sort of, you know, you know moderate. It's a, it, I don't think that something comparable exists in LA. No, and I think it's, it's one of the things we've got to work on because there, there are new ways people have to figure out how to put their, their careers together. Mm -hmm. And there are people who are, who are finding ways yeah. to do it in, in, in remarkable ways uh, in the pop world. Yeah, if you could, if you could train uh, artists and, and arts entrepreneurs and arts leaders, uh, to think in a little bit of the way, and that's exactly what you're saying, Steve, in, like venture capitalists. How do you present your idea to people who could help you make it happen? And, you know, and, I, and, I, and it's actually, I see this up, up in the Bay Area. So we're, we're starting this little process at CalArts right now. It's a tiny piece of this, but um, what, what brought it home to us was a young animator who made a beautiful work in, in a month that had a million hits or whatever on the internet, but he'd given it away. And he'd done it in a form in which he couldn't do anything with it except give it away. If someone had spoken to him toward the end of the process and said, you know, as an app, this makes 99 cents every time you download it, uh, this young man had all the materials and he could have sustained the next two or three years of his making if only 100,000 people yep. had bought it for 99 cents as opposed to giving it away to a million for free. Uh, but it is a new way of, of asking artists to think about themselves. Uh, and it doesn't come easily. Uh, if, if you're in fields where you're often not rewarded with money, it's easy to, to adopt attitudes that are basically anti-money. Yeah. Uh, or, or to be so great. There's a fellow who's just finished a wonderful film on the very great 
L.A. composer Morton Lawrenson. This film is splendiferous. And he's got it opening the Palm Springs documentary thing, the Washington Film Festival. And I said, well, you know, are you charged? He said, well, I, haven't, I don't really know what to charge them, so I let them use it. You know, and I'm just, you know, because he's so happy that people just, they see the film and they just say, we've got to show this. So I said to him, you've got to ask for this, you know, because you've got to make your money back so you can make your next film. But they really are. I mean, you know, they're, they yeah. don't have the models of doing something that's sustainable. It's not a matter of getting, getting rich, it's a matter of sustaining your crea creative career. And, it, and it's tough because art in one way lives on this generosity, uh, on this sort of free exchange. And in a way you, you hate to put a damper on it, and at the same time you want people in a more difficult environment Steve, we have to, to be able to sustain themselves. We have to assume long. parental responsibility and give them good <laughs> advice. Because we admire the generosity, but we want these artists to prosper. We want 10 years from them to be, still be doing what they love to do. Yeah. OK. Um, we're at 8 o'clock, so um, let me thank you for providing yeah. yeah. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> that fun? You and I eventually have to find something we disagree on. <laughs>